Hi, everyone. Uh, let's start the second session of uh, SC Asia HPC and AI track. So our uh, subject of this track is next generation of supercomputing, cloud native computing. Our next speaker is uh, Asaf Asrelevich from NVIDIA. Uh, his speech is the data center is the next computing unit. Hi, Mr. Assam, please. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. I'm Asaf Azrilevich at NVIDIA, and in this session, we will talk about the revolution of the data center and deep dive into cloud native supercomputing. NVIDIA is a full stack company. We're accelerating every layer in the stack from the silicon layer, through the frameworks, models, workloads, to the application. A critical element of the stack is the network, and we will talk about it in this session. The data center is the new computing unit. Let's start. Diversity of applications requires architecture flexibility. Why are we talking about cloud-native supercomputing, and why do we need it? The reason is that we need to provide supercomputing super services in a multi-tenant environment with bare metal performance, predicted performance, resiliency at scale, without any impact of the tenants that are running different applications at the same time. In traditional cloud, and this is what we see in this slide, there is a separation between the cloud infrastructure and the supercomputer. This architecture cannot provide a cloud-native supercomputing. In this architecture, the tenants that run different applications in parallel will affect each other. And we will see how in a couple of slides. The revolution that we are describing here is the cloud native supercomputing, where the compute and the cloud infrastructure are not separated, but they are one unit. Multi tenant environment where there is no performance impact from running different applications from different tenants at the same time. There are three fundamental requirements from cloud native supercomputing. First, provide bare metal performance and security. Second, higher and predictable application performance with performance isolation. And the third is the need to support edge computing. Here we are showing Bluefield DPU, which is an SOC that contains Connectix adapter, contains also ARM cores, hardware acceleration engines, and PCA switch. By using Bluefield on the compute side, we can achieve a complete separation between the host CPU and the infrastructure, providing a real bare metal with secured, with secured infrastructure. The infrastructure is managed only by the cloud provider, where the tenant can only access the host CPU. In addition, with Bluefield, we are running accelerations and boosting the performance of the applications and offloading the host CPU. A critical element of cloud native supercomputing is infinibent technology and its fundamentals. We are talking about in network computing. We have three compute elements in the data center we have the CPU, we have the GPU, and now we also have the network. With InfiniBand, the network becomes a coprocessor running sharp, adaptive routing, RDMA, GPU direct, and more. With Sharp, for example, we are reducing the latency of an MPI application by order of magnitude. We're also talking about um, architectural scale. With NDR, we can connect up to 1 million nodes with Dragonfly Plus topology with four switch ops, and we can connect up to 2 million nodes with four layers factory topology. And of course, we want the solution to be a software-defined network. And by installing UFM software package on one server or on one switch, we are managing, provisioning, and monitoring the entire cluster. With UFM, Bluefield, and Docker, InfiniBand is the pure SDN solution. Infiniment is, of course, standard and open, and it is not proprietary. 
For in-network computing and accelerated network for supercomputing, we are using the following InfiniBand infrastructure building blocks. This is an end-to-end -end network solution from PCI to PCI. So basically, we are using Connectix adapter or Bluefield DPU. We are connecting to a quantum switch via LinkX cable. We are using also MetroX for longer connectivity. We are using gateways. And of course, on top of everything, we are using USM Cyber AI software package. As we already understand, in order to provide cloud native supercomputing, the infrastructure needs to evolve. What we see with traditional supercomputing is that we have on the host CPU, we are running the applications, and we are running the management and monitoring, we are running the client file system storage, we are running the, the communication frameworks. Moving to cloud native supercomputing, we are replacing the InfiniBand adapter with Bluefield DPU. And then we are moving to Bluefield DPU, everything besides the application. So we are moving to Bluefield DPU, the management and the monitoring. We are moving the client, soft, the client storage file system. And we are moving the communication frameworks. Everything on the Bluefield DPU. And of course, the functionality of the InfiniBand adapter is also inside Bluefield DP, which contains Connectix. Then we, on the host CPU, we are running only the application. And this is the separation between the host CPU and the, and the infrastructure, which is, the, which, is, which is Bluefield. Now, Let's look on what happens today with HPC on supercomputing versus HPC on the cloud without performance isolation. If you look on uh, HPC on supercomputing, we see that we get the highest performance as bare metal machine. We see that we get predicted and very stable performance. However, when we are looking on the HPC on the cloud, we see that we get very low performance. It's non-predicted performance and it's non-stable performance. The reason is that without performance isolation, the performance of one tenant is influenced by other tenants that are running applications at the same time. Now let's see how we are solving this challenge. One of the key technologies of quantum InfiniBand is adaptive routing. In static routing, congestions in the network create buffer overflows and trigger, con and trigger congestion control mechanism on the end nodes without the possibility to automatically change the routing. It creates, peaks on, it creates peaks in the network efficiency and leads to unstable performance. With adaptive routing, quantum switch can dynamically change the network routing in line rate following buffer overflow. With this capability, the system doesn't need to wait for the congestion control on the end nodes to recover this overflow. This capability dramatically improves the network efficiency and the performance of the application. In a couple of slides, we will see also that we can actually predict the overflow in the switch and trigger a routing change before the overflow. By that, we are improving the efficiency of the network much further. In the bottom of this slide, we can see the application's benchmarks. We can see that, uh, that, that we are showing here that the performance boost that we get from adaptive routing versus static routing is, is, uh, is, is, major, is a major boost. And as, and as much as we scale out, the performance boost is even higher. Here is an illustration on adaptive routing mechanism you will see an automatic reroute following a congestion control, basically a buffer overflow in the, in, the, in the network. So what we see, we see server A that needs to send the data to server B. And let's see first what happens if everything is okay and there are no problems in the network. 
we will see that the data is flowing to the best route to server B, from server A to server B. Now let's see what happens if we have a problem in the network. It can be, it can be buffer overflow. It can also be uh, something wrong with, uh, with the physical network. The data will arrive to switch 100. Switch 100 understand that there is a problem with the original route. It will reroute and the data will flow through a different, to a best different route to server B. It is also working if there is a deadlock, and this is what we'll see in this, in this um, um, example, where basically this is a dead end because the data cannot arrive from this switch to server B. So basically we will change the routing much earlier. It will start from this switch and the routing will change from here and the data will arrive to server B. This is without sending the data again from server A. Now let's deep dive into performance isolation, which is critical for the cloud native supercomputing platform. On the left hand chart, we can, sit, we can see the performance of LAMPS from HPC on supercomputing, which is a bare metal performance, and from NVIDIA cloud native platform with performance isolation. We see that we get the same performance from both platforms. On both, we get bare metal performance. On the right hand, we can see how we enable the performance isolation that results in bare metal performance from a multi-tenant cloud. We are moving from reactive approach to proactive approach. The traditional approach is reactive. The receiver, the re the receiver, the receiver is getting a notification, ECN, for buffer overflow followed by congestions in the network, signaling to the sender to, to activate the congestion control like this CQCM. As a result, the sender is reducing the bandwidth. This, this process affects all the flows from all the tenants. For performance isolation, we are moving to a proactive approach. We are using time sensors, which are based on a nano-precision clock in quantum switch for buffer monitoring. The switch can monitor the buffer in real time and can signal when the egress port buffer is about to overflow. Instead of sending a notification to the receiver, the switch will send a notification directly to the sender for the specific flow. The sender will reduce the bandwidth for this flow. We're also using traffic planners. With traffic planners, the HCA can detect if the message that it's about to send is large or small. The HCL will signal to the switch on a large message. With this signal, quantum switch can predict the overflow and proactively operate the congestion control mechanism directly on the sender side. Of course, we are using telemetry to carry all the data and the signals across the network. Here are results for Microsoft Azure running lamps. So we see on the right hand, we see single tenant. So we get a bare metal performance and we get, uh, which is the highest performance, we get very stable performance and predicted performance. Then moving to the, to the middle chart, we see a multi-tenant. This is without performance isolation. Here we see the same picture that we saw previously. We see very low performance, very unstable, very not predicted. And again, the reason is that the tenants doesn't have performance isolation and they are affecting each other. Then moving to the right hand, we see that uh, we see the performance isolated multi-tenant. So we see performance of a single tenant and we see that with the multi-tenant, with the isolated multi-tenant, we get even better performance than a single tenant. This is um, results from Microsoft Azure now running, now, now testing with VASP. So again, let's look at, uh, at, 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 at the left hand. We see again the highest performance, the bare metal performance, uh, very stable, very predicted. Moving again to the middle one, this is again multi-tenant without 
performance isolation. And what we see here again is very low performance, not predicted and not stable. Again, moving to the right, to the right hand chart, we see the performance of isolated multi-tenant. And then we can see that we have exactly the same performance from a single tenant and from isolated multi-tenant. And this is basically the results of the performance isolation. I want to go back a bit to e-network computing. Here are the advanced network, network technologies and the outdoor acceleration. So only with InfiniBand we have extremely low latency. Uh, we support uh, smart topologies like um, uh, Fatri, um, Dragonfly Plus, Taurus, and so forth. We support adaptive routing. Of course, we also support RDMA, GPU direct RDMA, GPU direct storage, various of congestion control mechanisms, and so forth. On the acceleration and programmable engines, on the switch side, for InfiniBand, we support charts, which we'll uh, review in a second. And uh, we support self-filling network, which is based on the adaptive routing that we described that, that we described earlier. On the adapter side, uh, for InfiniBand, we support MPI tag matching. Of course, we also support all tool engines. We support also programmable data path accelerators. Um, if we are using Bluefield DPU, then we obviously have also the ARM cores. And with Bluefield, we also get again the separation, the, the, the isolation between the tenants and between the tenant and, and the infrastructure. A critical technology in, in, in for e-network computing is SHARP. SHARP is scalable hierarchical aggregation and reduction protocol. With SHARP, we are calculating MPI operations in the switch silicon along with the data flow in line rate. SHARP reduces the latency of MPI operations by order of magnitude. The MPI operations supported by SHARP are what we can see here, very reduced, all reduced broad, broadcast and more. We are calculating sum, mean, max, mean lock, max lock, or so, and end. And here we can see some of the results of in network computing. You see that uh, for small data reduction with sharp, we get seven, seven times faster order reduce, which, res which, which results in 50% higher performance of the application. We get uh, for, large, for large data reduction, we get up to 2.5 faster order reduce, which results in 15% faster deep learning and 17% faster NLP. With tag matching, with MPI tag matching offloads, we can get 1.8 times faster MPI calculations, which result in up to 40% higher performance of the application. We also introduce all to all engines with NDR, which results in four times higher throughput. It is important to emphasize that we are introducing new and enhanced acceleration technologies with every new generation. In order to achieve higher application performance, we are using Bluefield DPU. With Bluefield, we are using the hardware accelerations and the ARM and the ARM CPU cores to offload collective operations, data compression, management and monitoring, communication frameworks, and more. Bluefield has an important role in the software-defined network and in the user-defined algorithm with Docker. In the next few slides, we will, we will compare some of the results with Bluefield acceleration versus without Bluefield acceleration. Here we can see 44% performance increase for MPI all to all and 36% 30, and performance increase for MPI altogether when running Bluefield accelerations versus without Bluefield acceleration.
Here we see that when we run the MPI communication library on Bluefield ARM code, while the computing library runs on, on the host CPU, we get 100% overlap. As a reminder, without Bluefield, both the MPI communication and computing libraries are running on the host CPU. We can see here again the performance increase for MPI collectives when running, when running Bluefield accelerations versus without Bluefield offloads. For the best experience with Bluefield DPU programming, we are presenting Docker. Docker is a software application framework for, for Bluefield DPUs. With Docker, developers can program the data center infrastructure by creating software-defined and cloud-native DPU accelerating services with zero trust protection. Docker, soft, doc, Docker software consists of SDK and runtime environments. The Docker SDK provides industry standard open APIs and frameworks, including DPDK for networking and security and SPDK for, for storage. Docker simplifies the application offloads with, with integrated NVIDIA acceleration packages, standard I.O. interfaces enabling virtualization and isolation. The Docker runtime includes tools for provisioning, the, for provisioning, deploying, and orchestrating services on hundreds of thousands of DPUs across the data center. The APIs and, and SDKs are backward and future compatible. Applications that was developed over Docker on Bluefield 2, the, de the, the developer will not need to port again the same application on new devices like Bluefield 3, Bluefield 4, and so forth, because Docker is compatible with new Bluefield generation. By that, Docker protects the developer investment for future DPUs. If you will visit, if you will visit Do Do Docker developer site below, you can find reference applications and implementations for various workloads. For conclusion, the data center becomes the new unit of computing. We have three compute elements in the data center. We have the CPU to run the application. We have the GPU for accelerated computing AI and machine learning, and we have the DPU, the data processing unit for software-defined, hardware-accelerated, in-network computing. Thank you all for joining this session. See you next time. Thanks, Pilar. This is a very important message uh, for, for the next generation data center architecture, which is a cloud native computing architecture. Also, in future uh, data center, we should focus on the data center level optimization, uh, not only on the single server or single unit of the data center optimization. Thanks again, Asaf. So our next speaker is Dr. Dong uh, Lai Bai from Xscale Solutions. His speech is Xscale AI High Performance and Scalable Solution for Distributed Deep Learning Applications. So Dr. Dai, please. Hi, uh, my name is Dong Lai Dai. I'm a chief engineer with uh, Xscale Solutions. And today I'm going to talk uh, one of our uh, product is called X AI, X Scale AI. It's a high performance and scalable solutions for distributed deep learning application. And here is the outline, and uh, I will briefly introduce our company and then continue with the discussion of the main feature of this package. And I'll highlight a few uh, slides on the performance benefit of this package on deep learning applications on various system configurations. And then I'll give a, a, a few examples about uh, using uh, one of the tools in this package is called Deep Introspect to do performance debugging 
and the optimization. Then I'll conclude uh, at the end. So uh, we are a company that focus on bringing innovative and efficient end-to-end -end solutions, services, and support and training to our customers. <clears throat> we provide commercial support and training for end uh, state-of-the-art communication libraries. Specifically, we focused on the uh, Envo Pitch 2 libraries and its families, including Envo Pitch 2, Envo Pitch 2X, Envo Pitch 2 TDR, Azure, and uh, AWS, as well as uh, OSU INAM. We also uh, provide uh, commercial support and training for high performance big data libraries, uh, focused on the RDMA, specifically including uh, HD, uh, Hadoop, Spark, HBase and the memcached tools for this. And uh, so we currently, we provide uh, uh, commercial support for uh, several uh, uh, national labs and uh, international computer centers of these libraries. And uh, our commercial support uh, provide different levels of a service agreement and uh, these include platform specific and application level optimizations. Uh, we are a winner of multiple uh, DODE spur grants uh, to design and develop a new uh, innovative and value added products. We market these products for HPC as well as uh, AI applications. And uh, we are a silver ISV member of the Open Power Cons Cons Consortium. And uh, next, I'll highlight a few uh, major features of uh, X-Scale AI package. So this package, the overall goal is provide high performance and scalable solutions for deep learning uh, training, specifically distributed deep learning training uh, for uh, complex AI problems on modern HPC platforms. The focus, our main focus is first the easy to use, including deployment as well as execution. And uh, we focus on tight integration of the deep learning stack and the doing uh, tuning for high performance of this stack. And uh, we also focus on scalability of this uh, package to support thousands of GPUs as well as uh, CPUs. We also provide uh, introspection capabilities with visual support and for performance debugging, performance tuning and optimization. And uh, the following is a, a, a high level list of uh, the main feature and the latest release for this package is 2022.02. Okay. And uh, this is based on uh, Envelope Pitch 2 GDR. Uh, the, release, uh, the latest release is 2.3.6. And this uh, package is conforming to MPI 3.1 standard. Uh, X scale AI support all features available in Avapitch 2 GDR, the latest release. It provides great performance and scalability, and we integrate uh, all components in the software stack to run various deep learning. Uh, to support various deep learning frameworks, including TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, and others. And our target for, is for both CPU-based as well as GPU-based deep learning training. And uh, one of the tools integrated is uh, providing and uh, introspection support for deep learning across uh, 
uh, deep learning stacks. Okay. And uh, we, this uh, analysis, this help us to do the analysis across the stack uh, in a visual manner. And that helps the end user to optimize their DL applications. And of course, to explore the, uh, to, to get, uh, to take advantage of the high performance and scalability available. And uh, we focus to, to we, we try to reach out of box optimal performance and uh, tuning for various CPU and GPU based HPC systems. We strive to do a one click deployment and the execution. We have some, uh, uh, I have one slide to show this. Uh, so this will save a lot of uh, setup struggles of the uh, deep uh, learning framework for many hours or days, sometimes weeks. And uh, currently we support uh, both x86 platforms and open power. And uh, so in, we support the uh, uh, x86 uh, compute node and uh, NVIDIA GPU devices, and uh, also uh, IBM's Power 8 or Power 9 uh, CPUs. And the network, uh, high performance network we support is including Infinite Band, uh, Rocky, and uh, MV Link interconnect from NVIDIA. And uh, here is an example for uh, deployment or installation, as well as uh, running uh, your deep learning job. On the left, you can see that this is the uh, basic steps to do the deployment or installation. Basically, uh, it's three simple instructions. You, uh, command, you basically declare the first is where is your uh, coding uh, library pass? and uh, where is your uh, CUDA module pass. And then you typed one command, which is uh, xskill AI install. And then it will go through the whole installation process and uh, give the prompt to show the progress as well as what component and versions uh, it contains for this particular uh, package on your system. Now on the right, it's showing an uh, example of once after you install it successfully, it's showing the uh, example to run your application. It's just a one line of calling this package, okay? Then it will, uh, you provide how many uh, processors or device you want to run with for your application, then provide some uh, host file and your execution uh, executables, uh, as well as their uh, uh, parameters on the command line, a single line command. Then it will, if that runs successfully, it will, will run to the end. And after the run, uh, by default, uh, the statistics is collected and uh, saved. Uh, in specific directory. And uh, here you can either view it in the text form of the statistics, or you can view it uh, through a visual tool, uh, which is based on Java. And so you can see that uh, we have a Java call there. Okay, next I'll show a few uh, examples to highlight the performance benefits of this package. <clears throat> For this particular one, uh, uh, I, I think I will show four, okay, four different uh, system uh, configurations. Uh, we will try to use the same application. Uh, this is uh, ResNet 50 uh, deep learning training and using a PyTorch uh, platform, a distributed PyTorch using uh, Horvold. Okay. And uh, it's used the ImageNet dataset 
and uh, with various different number of uh, GPU devices, and we were trying to compare the different uh, the the uh, performance uh, benefit of uh, X scale AI package. And for this particular uh, system configurations, uh, it has it's uh, 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 it has two nodes, and each node had uh, eight GPU devices. So it's quite a fan out is quite high for this one. And uh, so uh, the, on the left, it gives specific uh, system configurations. As you can see here, it's using NVIDIA's uh, V100, Tesla 100 uh, uh, GPU device. And uh, each node, as I said before, it's eight. And uh, so the CPU is uh, uh, Intel Xeon Cascade Lake CPU. And uh, it used uh, four, uh, DDR4 memory, uh, 512 G, uh, GB, and uh, used two uh, Metalux Infinite Band uh, NIC card, it's HDR NIC card. As you can see, uh, we have two sets of bars. So one is the in the blue, uh, in the green, is a standard, uh, basically, is open source uh, horrible with a PyTorch. Okay, if you run your application use that, you will get uh, the uh, green bar in this green set of bars in this system conf uh, configuration, and uh, with the red bar shows the X skill. Uh, uh, AI package when you run with our tools, uh, our package, how what, how you get it. And the, the Y dimensions show the image per second, that's the performance uh, in uh, measure. So as you can see the, the performance uh, with, the, uh, with our package actually get a significant increase as you can see on the 16 GPUs, it's, up to six, uh, thirty-five percent uh, performance benefit here it shows, and this next uh, one is a similar. Uh, have, uh, yeah, similar software applications. It's the same software applications actually uh, on different uh, system configurations, and uh, the, for this configuration, uh, it has four nodes and four GPUs per node, okay? And uh, the, the use NVLink between the GPUs. And uh, again, it's used the same uh, Cascade CPU, and but uh, with a smaller amount of memory, uh, DDR4 memory, and uh, the same uh, uh, NIC card, okay? And uh, as you can see, the as the number of GPUs increase, the system size, system configuration increase. Here we can see the benefit is uh, increased by twenty six percent. Okay, uh, from uh, one GPUs to sixteen GPUs, and so it's still very uh, very good. And for uh, slightly uh, uh, for another uh, another system configuration. Here we can see that we have four nodes, two GPUs per node, and this is run again uh, with uh, distributed PyTorch with uh, Horovolt or our package, and uh, running a ResNet fifty, but use synthetic data set. Okay, and here we show up to eight uh, GPUs, and uh, uh, it basically four nodes, and with two GPUs per node, and the CPUs here is Skylake, and uh, also the the amount of uh, memory is smaller as well. Okay, and uh, the network is also uh, earlier generation; it's half of the bandwidth as uh, use the EDR rather than GD, uh, HDR. Okay. And as you can see that for this system configuration, uh, 
our package actually the benefit is even more up to 50 percent and uh, the last one i'm going to show here is a system configuration of uh, uh, a single node with four gpus per node and it's, again it's uh, running using uh, PyTorch and uh, uh, running uh, ResNet 50 use synthetic network, uh, synthetic data uh, data set. Okay, and uh, we're showing a single node here. It's still the performance is noticeable. It's 32 percent, almost 33 percent. So single node, uh, four GPUs. Okay, and uh, with the uh, system configuration parameters showing on the left. So as we can see that for various uh, system configurations uh, for uh, GPU and NVIDIA, uh, NVIDIA GPU and uh, Intel's uh, CPUs, uh, the benefit is very uh, significant, performance benefit. And the next few slides, uh, will just show uh, a few examples to use uh, deep introspection uh, to do performance debugging. Okay. And uh, as we mentioned before, that uh, the tools uh, is collecting uh, the statistics by default, collecting the statistics uh, all when you enabled it. Uh, during your uh, deep learning training. And uh, it's collecting, especially collecting the communication part, the uh, MPIs, uh, as well as nickels, it depends on which uh, uh, library you use for the communication, or you want to collect the stacks on. And uh, so this particular one is showing, uh, if you focused on the, uh, left right the figures you can so uh, see two figures here especially uh one is the latency uh for various size of uh, message okay and the other one is the total count and this one we show uh particular one this one we show mpi all reduce uh, all reduce actually is uh one of the dominant uh, operations in distributed uh, learning frameworks. Okay. And uh, so on the right, uh, right uh, lower corner will give you uh, the detailed uh, numbers, the numeric numbers, like this curve showing some trend. And uh, then uh, if you want to look at the specific detailed numbers, it's showing on the right. And this is a partial list. You can, we you have the whole list. You can pull down to look for. Okay, based on this interface, we can do some analysis. Okay, where, what, uh, whether the, the latency or communication latency curve looks reasonable. And the other one is where, where is most of the time spent on what message size and how often um, that size of message get uh, used during your application run, okay, deep, deep learning applications. And uh, for one example here showing, uh, this one we're showing up to 132 GPUs. Uh, devices for uh, Deep Lab 3. Uh, this application, it's uh, this is based on TensorFlow. Okay. And uh, as you can see, that uh, with this is before we tuning using the uh, this tool to do performance tuning is before uh, it's on the blue bar. Okay. On the blue bars. This is after out of the box you use this, uh, our framework, uh, uh, our package. It will give you some performance, which is compared to uh, ideal uh, scaling. It's uh, decent. It's about uh, you know sixty percent 
between 60% or 70% uh, performance. With uh, the performance debugging tools, if you use it properly, uh, for this particular application, it's we basically tuning the Horvold related uh, parameters, which adjust the fusion buffer size as well as a time timeout for that one. And with that tuned, uh, we basically double uh, the default setting for that, okay, for the buffer size and uh, increasing the uh, timeout uh, by about 50%. Then we can see that for this application, uh, the performance increased significantly. Here it's about 30% increase and uh, cl come very close to idea uh, scaling. And this is uh, another example of using uh, the deep introspect for performance tuning. And as you can see before we, and this is uh, ResNet 50, okay. And uh, this is, I think that we did this uh, on power, open power. And uh, so we're using 1K GPUs. And uh, initially uh, we, we have projected the, the expected uh, or idea uh, performance uh, measured in messages per second. And initially without any tuning, it's fair, it's actually performed relatively low compared to the expected uh, performance. After we identified uh, some uh, opportunities for tuning specifically in the MPI uh, library uh, to doing some parameter, to setting some parameters. Then we are able to achieve much better uh, performance. Okay. And as you can see here, it's also come close to expected uh, idea scaling. So we get about 90% speed up. And uh, overall, uh, here is a conclusion. So we expect exponential growth in HPC and AI uh, applications, basically. And HPC technologies are critical for high performance deep learning. It's depend on the hardware and current as well as software. Okay, and uh, our hardware support, the, the uh, platform we support, including x86, 64 bit CPUs, and open power CPUs, and uh, NVIDIA GPUs. And uh, currently, we are also working to enable other uh, GPU devices from either Intel or AMD. Oh, uh, yeah, we even consider some other accelerations, accelerators as well. And uh, X scale AI package is for high performance and scalable solutions for deep, deep learning uh, applications. And we also include in this package, we also include a deep introspect tool to, for performance debugging and optimization for both platforms. So if you are interested, please contact us uh, for a free trial of this uh, product. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dai. Uh, our uh, next speaker is uh, Mr. James Legg from the uh, University College London. Hi, James, uh, please. Hello, my name is James Legg. I'm a PhD student at the Centre for Doctoral Training in Data Intensive Science at University College London. Today, I shall be giving you an outline of my PhD project. This concerns the application of Bluefield cards to task-based scheduling.
Task-based scheduling is used in various situations in computing, but is not particularly popular in HPC codes. However, the new Astrophysics Simulation Code, SWIFT, from Durham University does use task-based parallelism and has demonstrated its usefulness there. My project has taken inspiration from this, but concentrates on task-based scheduling itself and considers how a Bluefield card could help. It will be helpful, therefore, to explain first what task-based scheduling is. Swift uses a task scheduler called QuickShed, and this diagram is a generalization of how it works. And presumably at this level, it is similar to other task schedulers. The general approach is to, to divide the overall computation into a set of smaller computational tasks. And then feed each of those in tasks in turn to an available pool of processors. For Swift or for my project, the processors are the causal threads of the microprocessors of an x86 HPC cluster node. Each thread ex executes a single task at a time. Of course, unless the tasks are embarrassingly parallel, these tasks cannot be executed in any order but each task may only be executed once its inputs are ready. These inputs are the outputs of earlier tasks. These data dependencies therefore connect the tasks in a directed acyclic graph called the task graph, uh, which uh, is an element of the scheduler, as may, as may be seen in the diagram. And so it is this data structure that is used to determine which task can be executed next. One of course needs a generator uh, for the tasks, which can be done using a program. If you consider a conventional computational code, you would see that it usually comprises kernel sections or functions that contain the instructions that actually perform the arithmetic on the data, with those surrounded by loop structures that cause the kernels to be repeated on different data. It is up to the programmer to define the tasks, but these kernels can be a good place to start. The scheduler has two main components, the task graph and the task queues. The task graph determines which tasks have had their dependencies met, meaning that they, the data they require is ready. These are called ready tasks, and these are, as a first step, included on the task queues. This function is marked NQ. When a thread on the processor becomes free, a task from the queues is allocated to that thread. This function is marked getTask. A thread that has finished a particular task signals that event to the task graph. This is marked task done. In response to that, the task graph works out which further tasks now have their data dependencies fulfilled and so are now ready tasks to be placed on the queues. Thus, the scheduler proceeds through the task graph until all the tasks have been completed. While the task graph ensures the correctness of the calculation, the queues determine the efficiency with which the threads are used. So QuickShed, for example, takes measures to prioritize those tasks for which data is likely to be in the processor cache and to prioritize tasks that are on the longer path through the graph, based on an estimate of how long each task will take. Here is a Bluefield card. This is a ConnectX network adapter with the addition of an ARM processor. This processor is a general purpose computer which runs on Linux and importantly for this project, it is available to the user to run any program they wish. We now come to how I've implemented the QuickShed scheduler, making use of a Bluefield card. In the standard implementation of QuickShed, both the scheduler and the kernels run, of course, on the same processor. When a thread has finished processing a task, that thread actually becomes the scheduler for a period so that it can work out which are the new ready tasks, put those on the queues and allocate a new task to the thread. A first step in this project was to realize that the scheduler can be put on its own process on the Bluefield. 
That is possible because the Bluefield card, which is attached to the Host X86 processor, has its own separate ARM processor. So now I'm going to put a blue box around the scheduler to indicate that it's running in its own processor, own process on the blue field. This step is, I think, counterintuitive given how embedded the scheduler of the original QuickShed is in the threads of the main computation on the x86 host processor. There will need to be some messaging between the host processor and the Bluefield processor, but the ConnectX adapter of the Bluefield card will forward messages for us between the ARM subsystem and the host processor using standard libraries. Here, the messages needed are the small messages that are needed to represent the get task and task done function calls. And of course, there is the latency of such messages, but I shall come back to that. So what has been done here is to put the control path of the application code on the blue field with the host x86 processor then becoming in effect a math processor card. The ARM processor of the blue field is of course not as powerful as an x86 host, but it is adequate to run the scheduler. So what's the advantage of this arrangement? The disadvantage, as mentioned, is the latency of the messaging and, of course, going to the trouble of doing all the coding for it. On the other hand, moving the scheduler to the blue field means that much more complex processing of the schedule can be considered. This would not be the case in the original QuickShed, where any such processing would take up valuable processing time, making the computational kernels wait. The blue field also provides many cores to allow such processing to take place. Moreover, it has its own access to the local area network. So in this new arrangement, the following possibilities are opened up. The first is that work stealing is facilitated. In large HPC computations, multiple hosts are of course used in parallel coordinating their calculations on different parts of the data. In an HPC cluster, each node could, for example, have its own Bluefield DPU running the task scheduler for that node. The schedulers on the Bluefields now have more resources available to them and so are free to chat to each other about progress with the tasks and to arrange work stealing between them. So a node that is getting on well with its work can signal this to its peers. And if another node thinks that it is falling behind, it can transfer the data needed for a task to the node that is ahead on its work, which can then process the task and send back the result. It is speculative whether any particular computational code will have time for this. The transfer of data takes significant time and Data for a task can only be sent over once it is a ready task. So um, this also means that it would have to be processed quite soon on its own node anyway. On the other hand, if it does work, there is an opportunity to gain processing efficiency here. The orange thought bubble in the diagram uh, just illustrates again that in this proposed architecture, the host x86 processor is dedicated to the processing of the computational kernels and is not involved in the conversations uh, about progress. Another opportunity is that some tasks in a task graph may be data transfer tasks rather than the usual computational tasks. For example, a task on one node may also need data generated on another node. These data transfer tasks are a particular feature of QuickShed and of Swift. The data needed, of course, exists in the RAM on the x86 host. I am working with an experimental library internally available in NVIDIA, which should allow such data transfers to be commanded from the Bluefield card. 
using the RDMA capabilities of the Connect X network adapter that is built into the Bluefield card. If that works, then it will be possible for the scheduler on the Bluefield, once it sees that a data transfer task has become a ready task, to execute that immediately without involving the host processor at all. As you can see, it is the blue field that sees the data transfer task is ready and which can then itself instruct the transfer of the relevant data. The x86 host CPO is not involved and so can continue processing the computational tasks. Moreover, there is no problem about the host CPU wanting to access the data concerned. This will not happen. It will not happen because the task graph has already taken care of the data dependencies. As mentioned earlier, the messaging latency has the uh, potential to degrade performance if the scheduler is moved to a Bluefield card. Not so surprisingly, this did in fact surface as a problem in my experiments. However, the results were not as disastrous as one might have guessed. In fact, the result presented here is very encouraging. It is for a test application program that computes a tiled QR matrix factorization in a task-based manner. The algorithm has an internal parameter, which is the size and number of the tiles into which the matrix is divided. The tile size should be chosen for optimal performance. And I discovered that the optimal region for the tile sizes was the same when using both the original quick shed scheduler and the scheduler on the blue field. This made um, performance comparison straightforward. One simply can ratio the execution time for those two for otherwise identical experiments. The graphs show the results for two different host machine types at the HPC Advisory Council, which were the Jupyter machines and the Thor machines. Uh, in the graphs, the different colored markers show the cases of 8 by 8 and 16 by 16 tiles for the same overall matrix size. Uh, the um, 8 by 8 uh, tile sets are shown in red and the 16 by 16 tile sets are shown in purple. The performance hit is only um, up to 3% for these two cases. And for the newer Thor machines and for the 8 uh, by 8 tile set here in red, uh, the value is only uh, up to 1%. It can also be seen that this pattern holds for increasing number of threads. Uh, available in the thread pool for executing the computational kernels, uh, which uh, number is plotted along the x-axis, which is important for, to, uh, for using this on today's processors. I've been discussing uh, locating the scheduler on the blue field. The graph, in fact, includes some points for some other locations for comparisons. These locations are shown on the next slide. So the locations tried for the scheduler process were on the blue field, as discussed, uh, on the same host as the kernels. Uh, so here uh, are arranged on a separate socket uh, from the kernels and for similar locations on another cluster node across the local area network. So now returning to the uh, red set of points for the 8x8 tiles and the purple set of points for the 16x16 16 16 tiles, each of these sets contains points for all those scheduler locations. Interestingly, despite the different latencies in these locations, the effects of location were not strong. In comparison, it was more important uh, to tune the internal algorithm uh, parameter here, the number of tiles. Another point about these timer ratios is that they are only for a first implementation of the remote scheduler. There are opportunities for optimizing the messaging arrangements within that. 
Therefore, these results do show that putting the scheduler on the blue field is, contrary to expectations, a viable thing to do, and further, that the opportunities for more complex scheduled processing mentioned earlier are also therefore practical propositions. Finally, I would like to thank those who have supported my work. This project was sponsored by NVIDIA Networks, so I would like to thank all there, especially Rich Graham and Jeff Wardino. <coughs> and of course, thanks go to my supervisors at UCL, Jeremy Yates and Owen Kenway, who are both now at UCL's new Advanced Research Computing Centre. There's a link on the slide if you would like to find out about that. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, uh, James. So our next session is uh, 2021 APEC HPC AI competition uh, closing celebration and 2022 competition opening. Uh, let's welcome Mr. Gilad Shainer and Professor Tan Ting Wei. So Mr. Gilad, can you start please? Uh, uh yes yes i can yes i can uh so before before going there uh I, i'd like to i'd like to express uh gratitude for the the folks that presented so far obviously looking forward for uh, the the next set of presentations i think those are great topics and uh, um, interesting developments uh related to to new technologies and so forth so it's great. It's great seeing uh, seeing that. Um, I'll try to be brief. I think we're a little bit behind schedule, so I'll try to be brief. So first, uh, first, I'd say that uh, one of the important things, one of the important activities that we're doing within the HPC AI Advisory Council is is the the student cluster competitions. Uh, those competitions help to, help to foster the next generation of researchers and professionals that uh, definitely will, will help to make our world a better place, uh, to help find uh, new cures to uh, new diseases, to help um, bring better energy or develop better energy sources uh safer products everything we do in supercomputing um in ai is essentially to make uh, our world a better place uh so for our next generation and the generation um after that and so forth it's important that we know how to leverage supercomputing uh to the best of its capabilities uh, so therefore, therefore managing the student cluster competition, it's a very, it's a very important mission. And um, this is our contribution. This is one of our important contributions to the world. Uh, so definitely uh, regarding the 2021 competition, I want to thank everyone that participated, all the students, all the teams, um, the universities that made it possible for the students to participate in the competition. I hope that um, students not just learn more about supercomputing and AI and applications and infrastructures, uh, but that they also enjoy the time as part of the competition and, uh, and uh, enjoy being part of that. Um, regarding, regarding the 2022, competition um happy to happy to announce that uh, happy to be part of the announcement of uh 2022 competition and uh, looking forward to see the new teams that will compete this year um again it's um uh, it's an important it's important mission of of the council i think it's uh, uh brings great experience great experience and the uh, opportunity to bring foreign knowledge about supercomputing technologies 
about what they can use for. Um, and that knowledge is priceless. And we're seeing students that took part of previous competitions that now lead research in, uh, in universities, in research labs, uh, leading technology development in commercial companies and so forth. That gives the student a great boost uh, for, uh, for the futures. And uh, of course, helps with the council mission to build a better place in the future. Uh, the 2022 competitions uh, will, will actually leverage uh, carpal or multiple supercomputing systems. Uh, we found that it's, uh, it's, it is important that we uh, enable or, or bring multiple supercomputing infrastructures that can be used as part of the competition. Uh, we also, the council is, is also managing the competition that, ha that happens at ISC in Germany um, and, and learning from those competitions as well. Enabling the student to access multiple infrastructures is important because they can learn about different topologies, different infrastructures, different computer side, sites and, and so forth. A different access, different access ways to different infrastructures. So first, uh, I'd like to thank regarding the infrastructures. I'd like to thank to thank uh, NCC Singapore of being a great partner of us uh, as part of the competitions and enabling the student with access to their own infrastructure, so the students can carry the missions of the competitions and run different kind of uh, AI and, and, and HPC scientific workloads uh, on NSCC Singapore infrastructure and, and learn how to run it, how to, how to optimize it and so forth. Um, so I'd like to thank NSCC Singapore for a great partnership and looking forward to continue with that in the future, of course. For the 2022, I'm also happy that uh, uh, the university, uh, the university uh, in Australia, the Australian National University or the National Computational Infrastructure or NCI, which is part of the Australian National University, uh, will be part of the competition. Um, and the student teams will have an access to the leading supercomputer in, uh, in NCI in Australia or, or the Gadi supercomputer. Um, it's a massive supercomputer that includes uh, uh, an acceleration uh, portion um, and it's built in a um, different kind of topology. It's a networking topology that it's called a Dragonfly Plus topology. Um, and, and it's gonna bring uh, um, great, great capabilities, uh, great capa bringing great capabilities to their infrastructure. So the student this year uh, will be able to actually run their tasks um, on, on two different infrastructures. The one uh, at NSC Singapore and the second one in Australia as part of uh, the NCI or the Gadi supercomputer. So they will be able to experience different infrastructures, different systems, different elements, uh, different access points and so forth and that will bring more or, 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 or enable them with more experience and increase their knowledge about different kind of infrastructures uh, out there. So I want to, I want to thank, uh, definitely thank NSCC Singapore for the great partnership and looking forward to continue with that in the future. I'd like also to thank uh, NCI or thank ANU in Australia for uh, uh, contributing their resources, their supercomputing resources for the teams here. So they can also leverage that as part of the competition. Um, I'm looking forward to definitely looking forward to see the teams, looking forward to see the progress uh, later this year and the achievements that the teams will be able to demonstrate. Um, so with that, um, Chin Chun, uh, I think that we'll pass Thank it you. to Tan. Yes, now you are together with Professor Tan. Yes. Thank you, Professor Tan.
Thank you very much. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, opening uh, speech by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Gila Chena here, uh, who is the chair of the HPC AI Advisory Council. Let me first and foremost thank uh, the Advisory Council for giving NSCC the opportunity to participate in this exciting and great venture. We've been at it for a few years already, and uh, we're proud to be a contributor and supporter of the infrastructure to support the AP HPC uh, AI competition. Uh, as you know, COVID and pandemic has hit us, and it's not possible for us to gather together to build a computer and run the student competition, and we have got to do it remotely. And as a result of that, NSCC is proud to be able to offer our Aspire One system for, for the general usage of students of this competition uh, as part of our contribution to the community. Um, we thank uh, NCI Australia uh, for joining in the bandwagon. Uh, Sean Smith, uh, who is the director of uh, NCI, is a good friend and uh, uh, the chairman of our HBC core group. And he has undertaken to do this, that he has undertaken to do this with the Gadi system is really an inspiration to us. And it spurred me as the uh, chief executive of the NSCC uh, to undertake that our new supercomputer, a Cray XC supercomputer, will, will now uh, be installed sometime towards the middle of this year. And I will undertake to try my best to ensure that if we can make it for uh, this competition 2022, that we will also contribute uh, a Cray supercomputer to and, and, and make it available uh, to student competitors in the competition 2022. 2021 has passed us. What an exciting year. And we've seen tremendous uh, developments uh, in the competition. And we thank uh, the uh, HPC uh, AI uh, team uh, for uh, um, mounting such a, a yet another year of incredible competition for our uh, participants and all of you students out there uh, who are participating in this uh, cluster competition. Um, we know that uh, we need to build more architectures to support um, the uh, myriad uh, act, uh, activities and, and competition modalities and uh, the challenges that we're going to contribute to uh, uh, taxing your, uh, your, your brains as we go forward. Uh, we have seen the tremendous importance of uh, creating a mini youth Olympic, so to speak. The Winter Olympics has just passed us and we saw how exciting it was mm -hmm. for people to compete. And if we can now create a mini Olympic for our uh, student cluster competition in HPC, can you imagine the incredible um, uh, uh, force that drives uh, innovation, that drives creativity amongst our young people and to enthuse them, enthuse them to consider HPC as a career choice. Um, so we hope that uh, this competition will play a, a, in no small way a part mm -hmm. in the development of careers of so many students uh, throughout the world, especially in uh, the Asia Pacific region. I note that this year, as I checked through my notes, that uh, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka have also com contributed uh, competition team members. So I'm uh, particularly um, encouraged by this development. And uh, so um, we hope that uh, as we launch uh, 2022 uh, competition uh, going forward, that more and more student participants will come forward from all the different countries in our region. Uh, let it be known that the HPC uh, Virtual School of ASEAN, so ASEAN, 10 countries uh, in Southeast Asia, have come together to launch an HPC Virtual School. And we've finished the first edition and we're planning for the second edition. And I really hope that students from all those 10 countries will form teams get the support of their universities or their tertiary educational institutions to support them to take part in this uh, comp uh, wonderful competition uh, that will help um, create new opportunities and new possibilities for supercomputing for all. And that is the theme of this year's Supercomputing Asia. And we're really proud that you have chosen uh, to use our platform to be the uh, launch pad of uh, this HPC AI co student cluster competition uh, for 2022. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Tai and Mr. Gilad for this great opening. So in order to help in our uh, competition team to have the better understanding how to participate in the competition, we especially invite three teams to share their competition experience. Uh, now let's welcome the uh, next speech 
Uh, next speaker, uh, Mr. Yi Chi Zhang from uh, Sosun University of Science and Technology to give the experience sharing. So please, Yi Chi. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Yi Chi Zhang from Sosun University of Science and Technology, and we are Sosun supercomputing team. The first prize winner in this time of APAC HPC AI competition. And today I'm going to share some of our experience in how to build amazing HPC team. Let's first take a look at our shopping list. What do you need for a great HPC team? The first thing on the list is the interdisciplinary talent in your team. It's very important because your tasks can come from every field in the academics. And this is what HPC is for, even if you do not have those students now. Just train them to be interdisciplinary and ready for tackle those challenges. And also you need many services ready for students to test with, because it's really a waste of time competing for computational resources rather than the computation itself. And also, and not need to mention, you need some applications for HPC challenges. And remember to be diverse, inclusive, and you need some amazing supervisors and coaches like us. So let's take a deeper look into what you need in a team. The first essential role is that you need a man to do operations and maintenance. Uh, which is usually me in our team. I deploy those operating systems, drivers, and environments to the system to make sure my teammates can run those programs smoothly without showing those annoying uh, errors. But of course, I won't sit until the competition ends without doing anything. So I'm also responsible for the benchmarking of this system. And during this process, I can also identify some potential problems in our systems and I can correct them. The next role is very important is that AI developer is essential in every team. As you be all know, AI is getting more and more important in no matter uh, academics or those competitions. And, uh, there is at least one AI-associated problem in average PC challenges in recent years. And most importantly, if without an AI developer on your team, it's basically not possible to tackle the task perfectly. You cannot even write a script to train the model you want. And also some parameters are largely empirically determined in AI training. So do find for someone for this AI experience. And finally, we need some HPC users from those specific fields like molecular dynamics or computational fluid dynamics. This will save time from learning those background knowledges and validate your results. I love this saying said by me. What do they want me to do in the HPC competitions? It's completing every task. And actually, if you complete every task and get the correct result, you actually can get a higher score than the average. If you can tune a bit better on the benchmarking or some application optimizations, Actually, you are the champion. This is a basic procedure of our optimizing a new application. First, we run a baseline result to see what, how much time it takes and what the results are. After we have a baseline, we try to tune those runtime parameters like how many processes we are using, which cores we are using, or which device we are using. Then we try to add those compiler options like using the latest instruction sites with fused operations like AVX512 or something else, and some precisions like floating 32 or float 16. Then 
actually is same time we characterize the application to find the hotspots it probably uh, is a loop if it's on cpu we try to, to port them into gpu if it's unnecessary we unloop the uh, this kind of the code here i basically list some points that you can optimize the application first is parallelization uh, sometimes you would get some scripts that written really bad and uh, with a lot of serial loops. The thing you should do is to distribute them on different cores or different threads and making uh, them run parallelly. It's done. Also, you uh, can enable some hardware features like the uh, InfiniBand or the NVLink or the Sharp from Melanox or NVIDIA. And also you can increase the scalability of the uh, application. If it's it can be only run on single node or single uh, GPU, you just rewrite it to make it compatible uh, for running on multiple machines, multiple uh, devices, so that you can make full use of your super cluster. Then make some vectorization like writing uh, CUDA kernels or something and uh, optimize some I.O., reduce unnecessary host to device transfer or device to host co uh, copy, whatever. And also, you, sometimes you will got some applications that only can be run on CPUs. Here, what you should do is just transfer them into GPU and let the strong GPU to done those computational works. And here are some general advices I would like to share with you. First of all is that you must test run every application whenever you know it. If you are a captain, at least you should make sure your teammate has run it correctly and you must see the actual results they have get. Do not trust their report. <laughs> and uh, also remember to get every score that you can get, but not risk on trying to uh, push a uh, score of a specific task go higher and higher it's too risky and not worthy then remember to replicate the computation environment detailedly on your environment sometimes using the same generation of cpu and gpu use use the same specs of infinite networks you uh, see the same version of softwares and if the condition is favorable, you can actually uh, install the, the operating system on your SSDs and bring them into the computation venue and plug in. Now, please do prepare uh, your submission files at least 10 minutes before submission. It's very important because we have been penalized because we doing that very late. And get up early, we missed the computations. Nobody was there. It's miserable. Here are some time tips. Uh, first, uh, IPMI is a good approach to manage your BIOS properties, such as fan speed. This is important and this will the secret spice to our benchmarking result. And also remember to check for latest HPC benchmark binaries. I believe the NVIDIA has made a lot of optimizations on the, those benchmarks, so remember to check it. And also to, uh, please try CERN. CERN runs greatly with OpenMPI and Intel MPI. They set all the environment variables that you need and do not bend your infinite band cables. They are very, very expensive. And finally, I would like to give my sincere thanks to uh, my uh, supervisor and coaches, Dr. Jing Fan and Mr. Uh, Jia Hua Zhao and the chair of CCSE at Sussex, Professor Wang Lianping. And thanks for every fellow members of Sussex Supercomputing Club. Without you, we cannot compete through those challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. That's all of my presentation. Thanks, Yi Chi.
uh, our next uh, experience sharing uh, university is uh, National Tsinghua University. Uh, welcome, Kevin Tsai. Uh, I'm Kevin Tsai. Today, I'm going to talk about the student cluster competition experience from NTHU. And, okay. And, uh, before we start, let's do some short boy. Um, I'm now, my name is Kevin Tsai, and now I'm the fourth year undergraduate student in NTHU, and I'm majoring in Department of, Department of Computer Science. And uh, NT, um, NTHU, Xinzhu, Taiwan is, you know, in Taiwan, Xinzhu, and we, our school is very, very close to uh, TSMC, the famous semiconductor manufacturer. Okay. And uh, uh, let's talk about my student cluster competition experiments. I first learned HPC by tuning and building Linux packaging to be uh, the Debian maintainer. And I started to join SCC, the student cluster competition training team since uh, the winter break on my several more year. And I participate in HPC AI 2021 competition in Singapore. As a team captain, uh, we also won the run-up award and HPC special award in this competition. And I go into coaching the uh, ASC 22 in China and the ST 22 in the United States uh, this year. So uh, I'm going to talk about what is the student cluster competition. It started in 2007, that is 14 years ago, as the joint event in the supercomputing conference in the USA. And it's supported by the HPC advisor and uh, uh, origin, uh, origin by uh, researchers, supercomputer technique staff, and you know, some industry partner. And the mission of this competition is teaching and inspire the student to uh, pursue a career in the field of HPC. And it'll, it'll allow six undergraduate students led by a team advisor. And to talk about the rule, the uh, demonstrate is breadth of skills, the technology and the science that is uh, take to build, maintain, and utilize the supercomputers. And it, it, it made by uh, self-building a small-scale cluster to run the uh, HP, some HPC benchmark uh, uh, applications under the limited time and the power. And usually three kilowatt per team. And the growing success of uh, SAC during this year that it becomes an international competition around the world. And uh, we our teams go to almost every competi famous competition like the SEC in the United States, the ISC in Germany, and ASC in China, TSEC in Taiwan, also yeah, the HPCI in Singapore. And our long 14 years history, so we are the most com pet competitions. Uh, part participations, uh, we are the one of the teams from the first competition in 2007. So in SCC, we come, uh, we participate 11 out of 14 competitions. In SCC, we join every year since the 2013. The HPCI, we got four times experience and two times experience on IFC, and we got. We got several awards, four times HPL championship and four times overall championship and uh, the seven times round up. And let's talk about the key of success. So uh, the experience inherited by tradition and culture in our team. Uh, the, the experience is critical that to come uh, Come uh, to this competition because you know the scope is very really broad, and the most team members study without any knowledge in the field of HPC. So we got this progress. We have first year training, and 
the second year we have you join some competition and then later one year you got coach you should be the coach to coach in the team so it is a long uh pro- process to develop the breadth of skill and technology and science so yeah since that we luckily we have the previous team member to be our coach so that means he can transfer the some keynote or some uh experience to you that may make make you um, learning faster and that's this patient and devotion from the students you know three years is a very long time since you got four years in college and you're the one week weekly meeting without any break between the semester you know it's almost every of the whole year the AAC is from the gen- January and then the AAC final is in April, HPCA is starting in September, AAC is in November. And you know, they also achieve some additional workload besides the course work. And the most knowledge comes from self learning, you know, on, on, on the internet, Googling or read a book, you know, not come from the teacher. And hence our team looks uh, looks for people totally enjoying uh, learning from heart, yeah. And also, uh, the support from the advisor in the uh, industry sponsor is very important. And our uh, our professor Jerry Joe has led this team for the past ten years. And the original training meeting agenda and the first team member find, was helping us to find a team member and provide some resource like a uh, machine or space. And uh, how, uh, we also supervise the progress. And the industry sponsor and they lead the HPC cluster and GPU for ICC competition. And they, uh, it pro- also provided uh, travel funding. And uh, we think it is more than a competition. You can learn lots of things. You can learn hands-on experience outside of coursework. The opportunity to use the million dollars of the equipment in the world, the most advanced com- uh, computer system. And you can travel around the world, make friends from the other country, explore in the direction to graduate study or some other things. And it was a life changing experience for many of our team members. And it also, uh, it also took some challenging, you know, since 2020 due to the pandemic, we can, uh, we can only come Pad online, and sometimes even the training must be performed asynchronously online. So it does case down a lot of problems like the communication. We cannot uh, just go to the meeting room face to face and discuss some of the topic that is not very good for uh, teamwork. And handling the additional workload between our uh, course job and HBC competition is also a very, very big problem. Yeah, and finally, uh, the conclusion. So overall, it's a very unique competition, unlike the others. And we've got we we have the great great thanks to uh, the one who made it happen. That that must be uh, Professor Jerry Joe and ourselves. <laughs> and it required a lot of effort, but totally worth it. And. Also glad to see more teams and school participating in the competition. And finally, looking forward in the, uh, to the next competition. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. <clears throat> Our last experience sharing is from the National Chenggong University. Uh, welcome, San Ling Huang. Please, San Ling. Hello everyone, we are the DHG team. Next is our experience sharing from this competition. Okay, I'm Jaru. Now I'm presentation about the PyTorch version and the CUDA version problem. So is, this is the main problem that we face during the build situation. And for all you can see below is that 
the PyTorch 1.7.1 doesn't support uh, NCCL distributed training, which is limited by its own version. So we try to use some later version like PyTorch 1.8.0, but eventually it doesn't support CUDA 10.1. And during this period, so we try a variety of methods try, trying to solve, solve, solve it. And in the next, and I will, I will present the, what we try to solve this problem. So as for single run, we try to NGC, which is NVIDIA container with whole PyTorch version support. And for multi-MPI and multi-GPU, sorry, we try this multiple thing or this multiple method try to solve it. And the first one is we use source PyTorch to build for MPI distribute package, which means, which is uh, distribute backend for MPI. But eventually this, uh, when we use PyTorch 1.7.1, we encounter many problems when we build with open MPI. So we try to figure out what else we could do. And what, we, uh, what else we try is that we try to pull the different CUDA version of NVIDIA Docker to Singularity, like CUDA 10.1, and CUDA 10.2. So based on the different CUDA version, we try to we try to build on different version of PyTorch, but end up it didn't make up too well because of the CUDA driver based on the DGX system, which is 4.1.8, and it only support CUDA 10.1. So we we are since we are limited to 10.1, we can only use PyTorch 1.7.1. And that's why we encounter the biggest challenge on building Torch UCC extension. So now we're gonna list some problem that we actually face. So this is the PyTorch version problem and the CUDA version problem. And this is what we do when we use PyTorch 1.7.1 with CUDA 10.1 on DGX. So as you can see uh, in the below, that it shows runtime error because group NCCL doesn't support GPU. Since we search from the internet, it says that either you could uh, use later PyTorch version or later CUDA version. Since the CUDA version is not, could not be modified. So we try, so we're trying to build PyTorch 1.8.1 using CUDA 10.1. And this is what we face. The CUDA, the PyTorch version 1.8.1.0 says that we should require the CUDA 10.2 or above. So, and we could have built on source and we could have downloaded from <coughs> PyTorch then or PyTorch uh, then org. Yeah. Both of the way we try is to make Torch UCC usable, but eventually it didn't work out. And so we're trying to search in another method and another solution. As you can see above, we see that uh, the CUDA version has the one, has one, that's called former compatible. And as you can see, if we upload the CUDA driver, but we didn't modify, as we, mod as we didn't modify the kernel mod driver, but we still could use the latter version of CUDA, like you see the picture on the right. But as we know, the driver version on DGX, which is 418, is not being modified. So we could only limit it to use CUDA version of 10.1, which means that we could not use PyTorch later version. And now moving on to the NGC problem, which we are introducing the Mu Chen to tell you about this. Hello, I'm Mu Chen, and I will tell about the NGC way of the DRM. And that uh, we we say first about the operation step. First, we simply pull the NGC oh. container 
on our server and build it completely and push it back um, and um, pull, simply pull it on the NACC server. Um, we both um, try the processing program and main program, but um, we can we can connect it to the data set, but we cannot submit the job to the NACC job system because of the lack of the uh, Spark system. Um, as you can see, uh, we can connect it to the um, job system. Um, okay. So now we will go back to our, even though all these problems, we still got some output to show. And these are the output that we got on the, the NSCC server using a single, single, single node in order to run it because, you know, because the multi core was having the, the errors mentioned above. And, and these are the, the nodes we run on our DJX4 T1 O2. And the results will be we use eight GPUs, and here is the results that's shown that's shown on screen. And also we have run another result that is using PyTorch one point ten point zero and CUDA ten point two to satisfy all the requirements to avoid the conflict uh, on the NSCC server. And and uh. Just uh, we should say that we have tested out uh, later and you on our own server. So we eventually tested out is that PyTorch we should use 10, uh, 1.10.0 and the CUDA version we should use 10.2 above to make Torch UCC success. So and because of limited, we use for CUDA in DGX, so we could not make it to build successfully the Torch UCC. And now we're, so we're only talking about the sing, uh, single DGX. And compared to the MLPerf training that I put on internet, we have managed to achieve the 80.4 80.40% accuracy, which is close to the uh, the MLPerf official that should be posted on the internet. So this is our final output. And that's moving on to the Gromex. Hello, my name is Tim, and next part I will introduce the Gromex. So first is the brief introduction is that Gromax is a molecular dynamics package which mainly designed for simulation of proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. Furthermore, Gromax is free, open sourcing software released under the GPL and has consistently been one of the fastest molecular dynamics codes available. And speaking of which, our task in this competition is to optimize the performance of the Gromax. So first I will talk about the specification on the NSCC. So based on SY1, we use the number 32 nodes and 24 cores per node to run the Gromax. And here is our environment for the best result. We use the Intel MPI, ICC, FFT, that all is downloaded from the SY1, which is Intel 19.0.0.17, and here we choose to use the FFT dub because it is running a little bit faster than the MKL library. Yeah, and also we download the CMake 3.20 to compile the software and also GCC 7.3.0. And finally is the Gromax 2020.6. So on the right side is how we use the CMake to compile the Gromax, this is the software. And at the middle is the environment variable I gave it to the script. So first I try the map by option and I use the entire MPI for the Ligner cellulose in 32 nodes. And I found out that if we choose to map by the NUMA, instead of just map by 12, oh sorry, the map by P process per resource, there is a 12 I miss on, miss on the presentation. So as a result, the, the, upper, the selection of map by NUMA is better than map by 12 process per resource per NUMA. So 
basically the following results were all based on map by Numa option. And here is our best result of Lignus Cellulus TF. The NS day is 24.1, time is 0 0.994. Here we compa compare with different nodes from 4 to 32. And as you can see, the 32 nodes outperformed others. And here also again, we compare the wall time with different nodes. 32 nodes have their best results with 0 0.994. And the next is I use the entire MPI to test with in different nodes for STM fee. And the best result of it is for NS per day is 40.174. As for the wall time is 0 0.597. And once again, I compare with the different nodes and it is easily compared. Is it obviously that the 32 nodes is have the better results? And same as the wall time, the, 30, the 32 nodes has the best results with compared to other nodes. And here I have compared our best results with the pre-download Gromax on the S5.1. So on the right side, we can see that the, our best result is a little bit slightly different from the pre-download Gromax. And based on the left side, I have, I have listed some uh, specification and I think the the, band, the factor of, for the difference is because the GCC version and also the way we process the parallel computing is the reason for the different performance. And however, we still face some difficulty is about, in the beginning, we tried to install the open MPI with ICC, Intel, Intel library, and also the UCX, but whenever we try to load the job on the S5.1, he also he always send, says that we request more process than the PPR for this topology can support. And as a result, we can only use the open MPI to run with 24 MPI processes instead 768 processes on 32 nodes. This is the result of running on one node. And as you can see, the performance is really bad. So that's the reason why we use the Intel MPI and trying to find the best result and compare with the pre-download Gromax. And that is pretty much of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sanlin. Uh, okay, uh, thanks for all team to share their experience for the uh, past HPC AI competitions. So hope this year we can have uh, more teams to give their experience sharing to help the new team to wrap up. Uh, now uh, let's have a, a closing session. So I will, uh, it's close to our uh, meeting end time. So with this, I want to thank for all of speakers uh, who is speaking in our uh, HPC AI track of SC Asia 2022. Uh, thanks for Professor Ting Wei Tan. Thanks for uh, Mr. Gilad Shainer, uh, Dr. P.K. Panda. Thanks for Dr. Da Qing Liu from uh, JD Explorer Academy. Thanks, uh, Professor Loy from NTU. Thanks, also. Uh, from NVIDIA, thanks Dr. Dong Lai from XGL Solutions and James from, uh, from uh, UK and uh, our three teams from past competition, uh, first and second place. Uh, so let's have a quick summary for today's uh, workshop. Uh, we talked about the next generation architecture of HPC AI cloud and data center, which is a cloud native computing architecture. Uh, Dr. Panda gave us a talk for the communication middleware design concept for the new HPC AI and data science technology. Uh, we had the discussion for the deep learning technologies from uh, NTU and GED Expo Academy. Uh, also, we talked about the uh, data center become the computing unit 
by NVIDIA. Also, we talked about the X scale AI solutions by X scale solutions. Uh, also, we talked about the cost based new design architecture with DPU, as well as the computation experience sharing. Also, we close uh, uh, APAC HPC AI competition uh, in 2021 and open our new competition in 2022. So uh, finally, welcome all of the competition team to register our 2022 APAC HPC AI competition through this link. Welcome to visit HPC AI Advisory Council website to register and participate our competition in 2022. As Gilad and Professor Ken mentioned, in this year, we will have the more options for both our CPU and GPU cluster. Welcome to play in this latest uh, hardware and software platform. Uh, with this, I want to thank again for all of attendees uh, to participate in our HPC AI track. Thanks. Bye-bye.